A Rebbe is a person who is a tzaddik, a godly person, a person of a different caliber completely, a person whose greatness is, he's a, and spiritually, he's a spiritual giant. And therefore, the question is, how do we go about making those choices? How do we know to make that choice? Very often, people also have the question, which is, how can we find, very often, and the same as in Chabad, that the first Rebbe, his son became the successor. The second, third Rebbe, the son-in-law became the successor. His son became his successor. And his son became his successor. Like, what does it mean? They keep it in the family? Again, if this is something about spirituality and greatness, it's not something which is related to family just because you're a son or you're a son-in-law, you get this position. It's, it's something spiritual. So I'd like to point out that this is based on, again, everything has a source in Torah. There's actually a Pasuk in the Chumash in the Torah where it talks about leadership how leadership is passed from one generation to the next. Um, let me show you this sheet here. You can give this, pass this down, please. This is a Pasuk in the Chumash, in the Parsha of Shoftim, which talks about kings. And the king is like the ultimate leader in a community. And it talks about how a king should conduct himself. So let me uh, bring to your attention the sheet that I'm giving out, where it says there's two sides. And let me first do the side that says on top Deuteronomy chapter 17. And we'll look at Pasuk 20, Chaf. Actually, 19 and 20 go together, where it says that he should have a Torah with him all the time. So he should always be studying Torah and he should always have fear of God. And in verse 20, it says, so that his heart will not be haughty over his brothers and will not turn away from the commandments, not to the right, not to the left, in order that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his sons among Israel. Which means that the king should always be studying Torah, have a Torah scroll with him, because when a person has a position of leadership, there's also a danger that when a person has a lot of power, God forbid, it can make them corrupt. But if he will dedicate himself to Torah and make sure that he's guided only by Torah, that will guide him and prevent him from deviating and just being there for the right reason, for the right purpose and doing things according to Torah. But how does it conclude? And if we'll do that, he will, this will prolong his days, will have a long life in his kingdom, he and his sons among Israel. Let's look at the bottom of the page where it says Rashi, all the way at the bottom, he and his sons. So Rashi says, this tells us that if his son is worthy of becoming a king, he is given preference over any other person. That's the source. It's not just, we keep it in the family, it's actually a Pasuk in the Chumash that a position of leadership like a king should go over to the son if he is worthy. If he's not worthy, then you'd see someone else in the family that's also uh, deserving to get that position of leadership, which would be a son-in-law. Again, these details are found in Gemara, but this is the source. In fact, I made a copy on the other side of the page to see something interesting. This is from a book that is a Jewish history book, but it's showing us leadership of someone whose name was Hillel. I think everyone knows the name Hillel, one of the greatest sages in the Talmud. So who became the leader after him? He was the leader of the Jewish people. Look what it says here. The, his son, Shimon. Who became the leader after him? His son, Gamaliel. And who became the son after him? Shimon. And then there's one person, Rabbi Lozabah Nazari, who is not part of the family, 
and the next generation, he was the leader. After that, it went back again to the family. Shimon, Yudha Anasi, Gamliel. There's about 15 or 16 generations where each generation, the leader was a son of a son of a son of a son of a son, all in the same family. You see the names are even the same names, Hillel, Yehuda, Gamliel, because they're all descendants. So what does it mean? That if the person is worthy, then according to Torah and Halacha, their son from the next day. If he's not worthy, then you look at other places. For example, Moshe Rabbeinu, the leader of all leaders. His children were not worthy. So who became the next leader? Someone else, Yahushua. If the, the children are worthy, they take, that's preference according to Halacha. That's what we find in many dynasties of Hasidic Rebbes, that it was their son and their grandson. Because it's not automatic. If the father is a tzaddik, then every single child is going to be a tzaddik. Nothing's automatic. Every person is an individual. But if the father is a tzaddik, it's possible and likely that their son is in the same caliber. So we have to see. One more question is, how could we see? You could only see what a person does in public. But how do I know what everything he does, if he's a tzaddik, and all his thoughts and his speech and his actions are according to Torah? How can you know about that? How do I know what he does behind closed doors? So the answer is, is an expression of the Mara used often in reference to many things. And the expression is the phrase in Hebrew, Lo nitna Torah lo malachi hasharis. The Torah wasn't given to angels, it was given to humans. It means Hashem does not expect us to know things that we can't know. So when we have to make a judgment, we have to make the judgment according to our physical eyes, what we see, what we could perceive, our judgment. And based on that judgment, if we do it according to the guidelines of Torah, Hashem will make sure that we won't err, we won't make any mistakes, and the right things will be done. So if we say, I don't know what this person does behind closed doors, Hashem doesn't expect us to have x-ray vision to look through the walls and to know what the person is doing every moment in the 24 hours of the day. But if what we see, the way the person conducts himself, that he's a person who is immersed in Torah study, a person who observes mitzvahs in, in, a, in an exceptional way, and he acts the way a tzaddik acts, his ca character traits are very refined. He's a good natured person, giving and caring and all the things that Torah defined the way a person should be, then we could and should assume that this person's a tzaddik and therefore he's worthy for this position. So first I wanna go into the, a little bit of the history of how did this happen with the other rebels of Chabad and then to point out what happened in our generation in 1950. <clears throat> The first Rebbe of Chabad was the Alta Rebbe. And he clearly gave instructions that his son should be the one to take over. And that was the Rebbe we know as the Mittal Rebbe. He was the Alta Rebbe's oldest son. Interesting, when the Mittal Rebbe passed, he didn't give any clear instructions. And in fact, the Hasidim had three choices. One choice was the Alter Rebbe still had a son that was alive, also a great, a great uh, spiritual giant. The Mittal Rebbe, the second Rebbe of Chabad had a son, his name is Rav Nachum. And then the Mittal Rebbe had a son-in-law, and this son-in-law was both a son-in-law of the second Rebbe and a grandson of the first Rebbe. He married his first cousin. And that's who we know as the Tzemach Tzedek. And for many months, the Hasidim had no Rebbe because when they went to one, he said, no, go to him. Went to him, he said, go to him. When they went to him, they go to him. Nobody wanted to accept leadership. This went on for a number of months. Um, I think about seven months. And then after this happened, There were a group of older Hasidim. They themselves were great rabbis and great Hasidim. And they approached the Tzemach Tzedek 
and they said something to him. I don't know if we have enough time to go into the details, so I'll try to be more general. They said something to him, which was sort of compelling that he should accept leadership. He's the one out of all the three that should accept leadership. And as a result of what they said, he accepted it. And then he became the third Rebbe of Chabad. There is an incredible story about that. I'll just go up for a second. When he became the Rebbe, he said a mimer, which was his first mimer. Our Rebbe's first mimer is Basi Lagani. His first mimer was on the words, the world stands on three things. Tzemach Tzedek. When he said that mimer, he started off like this. The world stands on three things. And before he went to explain, he stopped and he said, please don't accuse me of something that's not me. I have no choice. My grandfather is telling me to say this. And everyone's looking around. Who is he talking to? No one had any idea. And then he continued and said the discourse, the Hasidic discourse. A few days later, one of the older Hasidim, Rabbi Isaac Humler, he was one of the greatest Hasidim of that generation. He said, let me tell you something. He was talking to me. And he told him the following story. Some 30 something years ago, uh, the Alter Rebbe gave a Hasidic discourse. It was very deep. And the Hasidim didn't get it. So they asked the Alter Rebbe if they have permission, if the Alter Rebbe would do them a favor and repeat it to them. And he said, I won't repeat it publicly, but if you choose selected individuals to come into my room, and I'll repeat it to them after davening. So they waited by the room until the Alter Rebbe finished davening. And this chassid says, I was a young man at the time, but I was also one of the people that were chosen to go in. We're waiting. And then we realize the Alter Rebbe is almost finished davening. It's interesting. How did we know he's almost finished davening? So we know, again, this is another story by itself, that the Tzemach Tzedek's mother was the Alter Rebbe's daughter. Her name was Rebetzin Dvoraleya. And because of a certain incident, she saw that her father's life would be taken away that year because of his spreading chassidus. She did something that she took upon herself to replace her father. And she passed away. And al Rebbe promised her that he would personally raise her son, who was just a young child, two, three years old. So this child, the Tzemach Tzedek, was always in his room. And when the Alter Rebbe davened, he would copy him. He would also shake back and forth. The Alter Rebbe put on tefillin, he would take potatoes, put it on his arm with a string and tie it around. He took another potato, put it on his head. He was a little boy. And he played that he's putting on tefillin. They didn't have the fancy plastic tefillin that they have today for kids. So they were watching through the crack in the wall and they saw that this little boy is taking off his potatoes. So they realized the Alter Rebbe must be finished davening and he's taking his, his to fill him. And sure enough, a few minutes later, the door opens up and the Alter Rebbe tells them to come in. They walk in and he says, I, I was the youngest in the group. When I walked in, I was so overwhelmed. I, I became paralyzed. I couldn't walk. I just stood by the door frozen. And the Alter Rebbe said, who's there standing by the door? Not coming in. So someone said, a younger man, I mean, a young man. So obviously he meant to say he's a young man and he became overwhelmed. And the Alter Rebbe said, a young man will eventually become an older man. Let him come in. And then he walked in. As he walks in, and the Alter Rebbe is about to repeat the mimer so they should get it the second time around, he noticed the little boy that Samach Tzedek, his strings from his tefillin got tangled up by one of the legs of the table. So he was standing there and trying to untangle them. He's about to bend down and tell the little boy, please go place someplace else because he felt that it's disturbing his concentration. And suddenly the Alter Rebbe stops and says, leave him. He's listening. There's gonna come a time yet you'll know that he was listening. Nobody knew who the Alter Rebbe is talking to, but he knew the Alter Rebbe is talking to him because he was thinking to tell him to move away. And the Alter Rebbe says, he's listening. And there'll come a time that you'll know that he's listening. How did that mimer begin? The world stands on three things. 
some 30 years later, the Tzemach Sadr becomes the third Reb of Chabad and starts saying the Maimah. The world stands on three things. When this Chassid heard, he said, wow, now I really see his greatness. The Tzemach Sadr heard his thoughts and he said, don't accuse me of showing my greatness. I have no choice. My grandfather told me that I should say this Maimah now. That's when he became the Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek. No, of course not. How did he tell it to him if he wasn't alive? Well, because a Rebbe, even after his passing, they used to communicate with each other. And uh, all, many stories of all the Rebbe's of Chabad and many Tzadikim. That's why I said by Tzadikim, even after their passing, it's not the same like an ordinary person. And they spoke to them and they taught them and they asked them questions. So the Tzemach Tzedek, when he passed away, he had five sons who becomes the next Rebbe. So three of his sons became Hasidic Rebbe's in different cities. And actually the youngest of all the children became the Rebbe in his town in Lubavitch. And that's who we know as the Rebbe Marash. And it's interesting, the Hasidim were then also confused some went to this, some went to that one, the other one, nobody knew who to go to. Most of the Hasidim went to actually a different Rebbe. They went to the oldest son who lived in a different city called Kapus. And I heard this from one of the older Hasidim that the Rebbe Mirage had the least of all the Hasidim to the extent that six months later was Rosh Hashanah and they hardly had a minion for Rosh Hashanah in the city of Lubavitch. Eventually, all the other Rebbes, their lineage discontinued. And Lubavitch of today, which is Baruch Hashem, all over the world, a little bit more than a minion, Lubavitch of today are all descendants of that youngest Rebbe, the Rebbe Maharash. His leadership is the one that continued and lasted. And it's actually also an interesting story with him. The Rebbe Maharash was, was, uh, was, out of all the sons, he was more hidden. He would be very humorous. He would joke around. People thought that he was a little bit not on the same level like the other brothers. So no one thought of really going to him because they seemed to be much greater. There was one chassid who was considered one of the greatest of that generation. And he said, I'm going to the Maharash, to the youngest. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you a story that happened. And the story was that his father, the Tzemach Tzedek, once said a mimer, well, he said something in that Maimah which struck me, wow, this is direct contradiction to what it says in Kabbalah, in the Eitz Chaim, the writings of the Arizal. And he looked for an answer and he couldn't reconcile it, how it's not a contradiction. So he went to the oldest son and he presented the question and they sat together, they spoke about it, he couldn't figure out an answer. So he went to the next son, couldn't figure out an answer. So he went to the next son, he couldn't figure out an answer. By the time he finished, it was two or three o'clock in the morning, and he's going home. He said, the only one I didn't go to was the youngest son. But if they didn't know the answer, for sure he wouldn't know the answer. But as he's passing the room, the house, he sees that his light is on so late at night. And he's thinking, maybe I should go. Let me see. He goes over to the door. There was apparently a window in the door. He looked to see if he's up or he's not up. And he sees him, he's up. Not only is he up, he's sitting by the table and is, has a book in front of him, which is the Eitz Chaim, the book of Kabbalah, and that page where was the contradiction. So apparently he's dealing with the same question. Great. Knocks on the door, three o'clock in the morning. And he says, who's there? He tells him who it is. He says, just a minute. And for about two minutes, it's quiet, and he opens the door. When he opens the door, the safer is gone, and there are newspapers on the table. So he said to him, I came to ask you because I'm very bothered by this question on the Mimer, the Eitz Chaim, the Kabbalah, it doesn't... So he said, are you kidding? You're coming to me three o'clock in the morning with such questions? Come on, it's three o'clock in the morning. He says, listen, if you give me an answer, fine. If not, I'll tell the whole town what just happened. I saw you looking into the Safer. I come two minutes later, there are newspapers on the table. You can't hide from me. Okay, calm down sat down with him and he said he gave him such a brilliant answer on the question that he saw that this son is hiding something more than all the other brothers and he decided he's becoming his chassid and that was the Rebbe Marash. So when the Rebbe Marash passed, um, actually the Tzemach Tzedek did write a note 
that he should be the one leading Hasidim in the city of Lubavitch. But the other sons became leaders in other cities. Then came the fifth generation of Chabad, the Rebbe Rashab. That was the hardest. There were two sons. There were more, but two that were at the level that they could take leadership. And one was the one who we know today as the Rebbe Rashab, and the other was his brother who was actually older than him. And here, for 10 years, nobody accepted leadership. Not months, but years, 10 years, nobody accepted leadership. The Rebbe Rashab said, go to my older brother. The older brother said, go to my younger brother. And it went back and forth, which means that he did not say a mimer publicly. People came with questions. He wouldn't answer their questions. I'm, he's not a Rebbe. And this went on for 10 years. And in fact, the city of Lubavitch became almost close to a ghost town. Nobody came there anymore. Eventually, again, a group of Hasidim got together, the older Hasidim. They were Hasidim a few generations back, and they said, we can't, this can't go on anymore. They have to do something about it. And they made a campaign. They made a campaign that Hasidim from all over should come to the city of Lubavitch, where the Rebbe Rashab is, for Rosh Hashanah. And when he'll see such a huge crowd that came to hear Hasidim from him, Hopefully that'll, that'll make things change. And that's what happened. It was the first time in 10 years, about 600 people came. In those days, that was a crowd. And the Rebbe Rashab saw such a crowd, he went out to the public and he said a mimer. And then it took another little while and eventually he took on leadership. He was very young. At the time that his father passed, he was 22 years old. And when he took on leadership, it was 10 years later, he was 32 years old. Yeah. Why? Why did they go to the Rebbe Rashad? I'm not sure if it's connected to that, but at that time, the older brother moved away from the city of Lubavitch. Oh. And it's even possible, I think it's written somewhere, that one of the reasons why he didn't want to accept leadership was because of his older brother. And once his older brother left, well, moved out, then he did accept leadership. The next Rebbe, which is the sixth Rebbe of Chabad, the previous Rebbe, whose day of passing is today, he was a one and only son, so there wasn't any other choices. He immediately took over the leadership. So I want to say that um, with our Rebbe, it took a year, and the Rebbe refused to accept leadership, and I want to go into the details of that story. It's a, really a lot of details involved. I'll try to cover the general idea and explain it as well. But this is one of the areas where you see a striking difference between leadership in the Torah world and leadership in the secular world. One of the most ugliest, horrible times in any country is elections. When people are running for elections, all the dirt and all the filth come out. This one did this and this one did that and he doesn't deserve to be president. I'm much better than him. And my predecessor did not know what he's doing. He destroyed this country and I will rebuild the country. So basically each candidate talks about how great they are. That wouldn't be bad enough. How terrible the other one is. And then they try to reveal hidden secrets of what they know about this person, that person. So unfortunately in every country, it's a very hard time where a lot of garbage is thrown around and people are very, very uncomfortable. In the Torah world, it was very interesting. We see the exact opposite. When people were chosen to become a leader, when they chose that, they actually refused to accept. And they did everything they possibly can to say, not me. The Gemara tells a story of someone called Rabba that he went as far as running away to another country. They shouldn't take him. They had to travel to Egypt, pull him back and bring him back to where he was in Babylon, I guess, to accept leadership. Where do we find the precedent for this? You know where? In the Chumash, the first leader, Moshe Rabbeinu. Who offered him the position of leadership? Hashem himself. What did Moshe say? Me, no, I have an older brother. I can't speak good. I have a speech defect. And it says in the Med, this is in the Chumash, not even Medrash. In the Medrash, it says that the dialogue between Hashem and Moshe went on for a week, back and forth. Hashem gave a reason for yes, Moshe gave a reason for no. Hashem gave a new reason for yes, he gave a new reason for no. A week, imagine, this is Hashem and Moshe, so it must have been a very deep dialogue. But 
Hashem is telling you to do something and you say, I can't. Finally, Hashem said, enough is enough. You have to take this position. And that's when, that's when it ended. No negotiations. Moshe became the leader. We find something similar with the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov was told, he was a hidden tzaddik. The time has come to come out of the open and be a leader open. He refused. And his Rebbe said to him, he had a Rebbe who taught him the t- secrets of Hasidus. And he said, if you will not take on the position of leadership, I will no longer appear to you. I will no longer meet with you. I will no longer study with you. Finito. And that went on for a long time and it still didn't work. And finally he told him, I want you to know that your neshama came to this world for this purpose. And if God forbid you refuse to become revealed and take on a position of leadership, then you have no more purpose in this world. That'll be the end of your life. And that eventually he took it on. Yes? The Baal Shem Tov is the same as the Alter Rebbe? No. The Baal Shem Tov was the founder of Hasidic movement. He was two generations before the Alter Rebbe. But he wasn't considered a Rebbe. He was. He was the first of the line of Rebbes. He wasn't Rebbe of Chabad, but he was the Rebbe of all the Rebbes, you can say. All Hasidic leaderships and all Hasidic courtyards, they all stem from the Baal Shem Tov. And also from the Alter Rebbe? No, Alter Rebbe is only Chabad. Oh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so let me describe a little bit what happened by the Rebbe. And then I'll explain what is, why do they refuse exactly? And how do they eventually come to take it? If people put, just because they're putting pressure on me, so what? Put pressure. You don't want, you don't want. And I'm not saying the Rebbe just said no. They were very sharp in their answers. Like imagine a leader runs away to another country to hide so you shouldn't accept them for leadership. The, the, the striking contrast to leadership in, in other places. Of course, it has to do with being humble and not looking for a position of leadership because you, know, you don't want it, God forbid, to uh, look for honor and look for people uh, looking up to you. You want to just serve Hashem with in a very sincere way, but there's more to it, which I'll soon explain. So let's start what happened in 1950. When the previous Rebbe was nostalgic, he had, previous Rebbe had no sons, only daughters. One daughter and her husband, unfortunately, they were killed by the Nazis. And two sons, two daughters and two son-in-laws were here in the United States. The Rebbe was the younger one, and the older one was called Rashad. The Rebbe's wife, the Rebbe Sinchai Mushka, and the other daughter, her name was Chana. They came earlier to America together with the previous Rebbe. Our Rebbe came a little bit later. And um, when the Rebbe, previous Rebbe passed, he also he did not leave a will, at least now that we know of who should take on leadership. We don't know why. If he was prepared and so many other things that he did because he knew what was coming, how did he not do that, but I think if you if you paid attention to what I told you, you would realize it's almost like they alternated. One rebbe gave clear instructions, the next rebbe didn't. The next rebbe gave clear instructions, the next rebbe didn't. So for whatever reason, the previous rebbe did not leave something clear that the rebbe should take over. So when it happened, there were those people that thought that the rebbe should be the new leader, and they had their reasons why. And there were those people that thought that the other son-in-law should be the new leader. And there was a difference of opinion. But most of the Hasidim believe that our Rebbe should be the one to take over leadership. And it was based on the fact that the previous Rebbe in the last years um, authorized the Rebbe to do a number of things. The Rebbe was more or less in charge of three major organizations that he established. He put the Rebbe in charge of all three of them. And... uh, Many other things that the Rebbe did, which was very unusual, and many Hasidim saw in this that the previous Rebbe gave the Rebbe, uh, look, perceived the Rebbe differently than, than the other, other one. The other son in law was older, so some people thought differently. One is called Merkez Lenyane Chinuch, which is in charge of all the schools and the educational system. One is called Kahas, which is all about printing Torah books and Hasidic books, books for adults, for children, to spread Yiddishkeit through publishing books. 
and the other one is called um, the third one. I said Magis Lunya Nechinuch Kahos, and you know what the third one is. Okay, it'll come to me soon. <laughs> what? Sivot Hashem is something the Rebbe established, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. 19, 1980. <clears throat> so the Rebbe was very, very sharp with people that approached him to accept leadership, but he said, under no circumstances. And let me describe it to you a little bit what was going on. How do I know? I wasn't an adult at that time. And uh, I noticed because there was a book that was published. And that book, it has a description of what went on the first year. It's called You May Bracious, which means the, the early days, the first days. It describes the whole first year. So a few days later, right after it happened, Hasidim already approached the Rebbe to accept leadership. And the Rebbe refused. He said, the Rebbe is alive and there's no point in, in choosing anybody. So the Chassid said, well, every generation that's the Rebbe was continues to live, and yet we chose a new Rebbe. And the Rebbe said, well, who do you think? Me? And he left. And that was it. Now, in Chabad, there's an interesting custom which is different than other Chassid. Yeah. That is, in Chabad, out of respect to the Rebbe, Chassid doesn't shake the Rebbe's hand. When you see the Rebbe shaking the Rebbe's hand, it's usually people that are not Chassidim. But respect the Rebbe because out of respect, shake someone's hand. But Hasidim, it's too much of a closeness. You stay at a distance. Before the Rebbe became Rebbe, people would meet him and say hello, shake his hand. Once the, well, the Hasidim said, with taking on the Rebbe to become a Rebbe, they wouldn't shake the Rebbe's hand. So the Rebbe would meet people, go like that, and the people would go like this. Wow. The Rebbe would say, no. And they refused. Now, the, the Rebbe was doing something to show nothing has changed. And he didn't want, right? They tell a story that there was a family that went to speak to the Rebbe and the Rebbe st stretched out his hand to the one, one of the little children. You know how little children are? They start shrugging the shoulders. No, no. The Rebbe said, you also don't want to give me my hand? You know, this little one. But um, what Hasidim did traditionally was, how did they actually accept the Rebbe as a Rebbe? They would write, it's called the Ksav His Kashrus. They wrote a letter saying like this, we Hasidim uh, accept upon ourselves your leadership, we'll be dedicated to you, we'll be following your instructions, your directive, and we wish you that you should be succeeding in your, what you're doing. But most, the, the main part of the text is that if we want the Rebbe to be our leader, then we have to tell the Rebbe that we are ready to submit ourselves to his leadership. And who signs on it? All the Hasidim sign on it. So Hasidim began to compose these letters in France, in Israel, in Montreal, in Canada, in England, here in America, and send these letters to the Rebbe. And then nothing changed. But it was interesting. Some people got answers like, I got your letter, and I'll read it at the Oho. At the so by writing, I got your letter, it sounds like he's not dismissing it. But on the other hand, he didn't accept leadership. Another thing which was confusing was the Rebbe was like the Rebbe Marash. Before he became Rebbe, was very hidden. He hid his greatness. And if you know, the Rebbe used to work here in the Navy Yard. The Rebbe went to a university in France. It looked like he was a university, Chas Shalom student, even though there was much more going on. So people on the outside didn't see the, wow, this is a, a Rebbe. They didn't see that. And therefore, the Rebbe would wear a gray hat rather than the, the class, the traditional black hat that every chassid wears. Also, someone who's in a position of leadership, even if he's a rabbi in a shul, would wear a longer coat. Most chassidim wear this only on Shabbos, which we call a kapata. But the, of course, the Rebbe would wear a long coat. And even people that are not Rebbe's, if they're Rosh Hashiva, they're heads of a yeshiva, heads of organizations, they would wear a long coat. But the Rebbe specifically wore a short coat and a gray hat. The previous Rebbe passed away on Shabbos. On Shabbos, the Rebbe wore a black hat and a long coat. And he continued to wear the black hat and the long coat the weeks after. 
So people felt that's a sign that he's taking on the position of leadership. After 30 days, the Rebbe did not change the kapata. I mean, uh, it did not change the hat, but he changed the kapata, which means he went back to the short jacket, but he left with a black hat. So is he changing or not changing? It was confusing. I'll explain all that a little bit later. So people were starting to send letters from different parts of the world. I know in France, my grandfather lived in France. He was one of the people that were involved. And he wrote to the Rebbe a letter personally that how could the Rebbe has to accept. This was traditionally done by the older Hasidim. He was a Hasid of the previous Rebbe, of the Rebbe Rashab. And uh, uh, you know now we, we don't have any Hasidim anymore. And the Rebbe answered back very sharply, very sharply. How could you say this? And how could you say that? People wrote to the Rebbe about accepting. They said, do you know what you're talking about? Do you know what a Rebbe is? Do you know what kind of, what kind of uh, 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 spiritual capacity a Rebbe has? How can you even suggest such a thing? How does it even enter your mind? Sharp answers like that. And to give a few examples of what people said to the Rebbe that tried to bring the Rebbe to accept. I want to give you another example of what I mean. There was someone in England that had an organization and he just went ahead, he printed stationery, he wrote the organization is under the leadership of Kavod, Kedusha, Sadoneinu, Moreinu, Rabbeinu, under the Rebbe, and he wrote the titles of a Rebbe. And he sent it into the Rebbe to show what he did. He got a telegram that he should immediately burn all the stationery and not even dare do this again. There was a... <clears throat> There was a, an interesting story with someone who, uh, an older chassid, when people came to the Rebbe with a request, they said, go to the OL and ask the previous Rebbe. So this person was an older chassid, and the Rebbe said, go to the OL and ask the previous Rebbe. He said, I can't. I'm not allowed to. I'm not allowed to? Why not? And he told him a story that he was by a, a very big Rebbe in Israel called the Bells Rebbe, Rebbe of Bells. And many years ago, and the rabbi told him three things that he shouldn't do. And one of them was, don't go to the gravesite of tzaddikim. I had no idea why not. But told him, don't go to the gravesite of tzaddikim. So the rabbi said, well, if someone like that told you not to do it, you can't do it. Why don't you ask him the reason? Why did he tell you to do that? So the chassid answered, whatever, I didn't ask him. But once the rabbi heard he can't go to the aisle, the rabbi put on his hat and jacket, garpul. And he answered him like a Rebbe answers. And they say this is probably the first pun that the Rebbe accepted. As a result of the fact that the other Rebbe told him, don't go to the oil. It looks like perhaps that Rebbe saw that this would be instrumental in bringing the Rebbe to start answering the pun. Uh, the Chassidim said one of the things the Rebbe said was, I never heard from my father-in-law any kind of indication that this is what I should be doing. So after that, a minion, 10 older Hasidim went to the Ohel and they said to the previous Rebbe that we're trying to ask the Rebbe to accept leadership. And he said, he never heard anything from you. So tell him to accept. And they said, after that incident, after that visit, the Rebbe never again said, I, wasn't, I didn't hear anything from my father-in-law. The, um, the people who wrote up the Rebbe's Sikha, uh, the Rebbe with Fabreng, Fabrengen had nothing to do with being Rebbe, because that he did even before he became the Rebbe. The previous Rebbe instructed him that he should Fabreng and speak publicly, thank you, to, uh, he should speak publicly to the Hasidim every Shabbos Mubarakim. So one of the people who was in charge, his name was Rabbi Khan, just passed away um, not long ago. He was the one who used to write it up. He approached the Rebbe and he said to the Rebbe, uh, I'd like to make copies of it and, and spread it out so other people can also read. Is it okay? Yeah, it's okay. So he made the copies and he wrote on top, these are the talks of the Rebbe. He wrote the term, Kweg Adma Rebbe. Anyway, the Rebbe looked at it, took a pencil, erased those words. Uh, don't put that there. Out. He did it? Yes. He had to remove it? He had to remove it, yes. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> When they call the Rebbe up to, I don't know what to do here. When they call the Rebbe up to, uh, to reading from the Torah, 
They don't usually pronounce the Rebbe's name because it's not respectful. So when we call up the Rebbe to the Torah, we'd say, Yamod, Kavod, Kedushin, Sadonenu, Moreno, Rabbeinu, the son of Arav Levi Yitzvah. The Rebbe wouldn't go to the Torah with that. They had to call the Rebbe by his name, like everybody else. This is all in the beginning, the first year, right? The Navy Yard is where they build ships. Yeah, it's not far from here. Yeah, they built ships for the army. And when the Rebbe was in the Sorbonne University, he had a degree in engineering. But the Rebbe, there's actually stories how the Rebbe was involved in different things that were taking place in World War II. It's another story. Yeah. <laughs> you can ask me something. I don't know if I can answer, but you can ask me. Yeah, I said I'm going to explain that at the end. So I'm trying to get to the end because time is running out already. There was another chassid. He was not just an ordinary chassid. He was the secretary of the previous Rebbe. He was a big chassid in the times of the Rebbe Rashab. And he, his name was Rabbi Simpson. And he told the, the Rebbe, I had a dream last night. And I saw the previous Rebbe in my dream. He was the secretary of the previous Rebbe. And I said to the previous, the previous Rebbe, I said, why do you look so sad? So he said, you know why we look sad? We don't have anyone to lead us. So he says, so why don't you go to my son-in-law? So he said, because he says that you didn't tell him anything. This is all in his dream. So the free the Greva said, okay, go call him. So I was going to call you, and then I woke up. So the Rebbe said, so dreams. You had a dream. Big deal. Dreams are dreams. So you probably thought about it by day, so you dreamt it at night. He said, no, Rabbi, I didn't even think about this by day. So said, anyway, it's only a dream. I wouldn't pay attention to it. By the way, by the way, could someone stop that thing there? The clock. The clock. <laughs> My biggest competition. I, I'm not even halfway through. Okay, quickly, I just want to tell you the story. There is an expression, Gemara, dreams, shavi da bear. Dreams mean nothing. But there's a story with the chassid. It was not a Chabad chassid. It was a chassid of another Hasidic group. He lived in Crown Heights. He would come very often to the previous Rebbe. And after Yitzvat, when the Rebbe took on leadership, he stopped coming because, because he uh, didn't feel the respect for the Rebbe. The Rebbe was a young man. And like I said, the Rebbe was in a university in France. He didn't feel that he's really a Rebbe. So he stopped coming. One night, it was a Friday night, he had a dream. But the Friedrich Rebbe said, why don't you go to my son-in-law? It was very vivid, and it was like, wow. So he decided he's going to go. He went to 770, and he was standing near the Aron Kodesh. The Rebbe had a custom when he walked into shul, he would touch the curtain that hangs on the Aron Kodesh, and then walk to his place. And he was standing right there. So the Rebbe walked in and turns to him and says, dreams mean nothing. And he continued to walk. Once the Rebbe said to him, dreams mean nothing, he knew that this means something. Because how would the Rebbe know that he had a dream that he should be coming to the shul tonight? But anyway, this is what the Rebbe told this person. And um, one more thing I'm going to tell you, because there's a whole list of things, but we have to move and really want to explain what's behind all this. One more thing is that there was a story with the Alter Rebbe, that the Alter Rebbe was talking about how the opposition was, was intensifying and a lot of terrible things were happening to the Hasidim because the other Jews who were against Hasidim were really uh, persecuting them in so many different ways. The Alter Rebbe spoke about it, and in the middle of speaking, he fainted. They tried to wake him up. They couldn't wake him up. Tzemach Tzedek was a little boy at the time, and he ran over and gave the Alter Rebbe his hand and said, uh, Zayda, Grandpa, stand up. And he gave him his hand. And the Alter Rebbe woke up, held his hand, and he got up. And he said his name was... The Semach Tzedek's name was Menachem. And it says in Rashi, in Chumash, in Gemara, that Ze Yinachameinu. This one, this person, will comfort us, will bring comfort and consolation to us. And then he added, he'll bring consolation to us now and consolation in the future. Mm-hmm. So this older Chassid said to the Rebbe, your name is the same name, and you're a grandson of the Semach Tzedek, and what did the Alter Rebbe mean? That it'll console us now and in the future. 
He became the Rebbe then, and you'll be becoming the Rebbe now. When he said that to the Rebbe, the Rebbe didn't respond. But it looked like he felt that the Rebbe accepted it. And, and there was another, another thing, which is, again, a lot of details to it, but a gartel, the, the gartel that we put on, the belt, in general, is an explanation that this is a, um, a symbol of leadership. And every Rebbe bought a specific gartel for their grandson or son on the day of their bar mitzvah. The Alter Rebbe for the Mitzvah Rebbe, the Mitzvah Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe for the Tzemach Tzedek, Tzemach Tzedek for Rebbe Marash. It's interesting. They bought it only for that son that in the future became the Rebbe. So a person walked into the Rebbe and says, I was by your wedding. And I remember by the wedding that the previous Rebbe put on your gartel, on you. The previous Rebbe put the gartel on the Rebbe. And when he put on the gartel, he said, with this, we're being bound to each other for now and forever, in this world and in the future. He said the Rebbe went pale because the gartel was always a, a, a sign of leadership. And again, the Rebbe didn't respond. So basically people were saying things, letters were kept coming in, and this was the final. The final was, it was a, a few weeks before Yudshvat, it was the 24th of, it was the Alter Rebbe passing, and the Hasidim decided to put in a notice in the newspaper, the Jewish newspaper, and it said, a new Shvat, it's coming up, we're going to be commemorating the passing of the previous Rebbe, and we'll be appointing Rabbi so-and-so as the new Rebbe of Chabad. The Rebbe called in his secretary, and he said, I want you to put in a disclaimer in the newspaper that it's not true. So he was uh, panicking a little bit, and he called the older Hasidim, he said, what should we do? He wants me to write in the newspaper that it's not true. So they uh, went into the Rebbe, three or four older Hasidim, and they were going back and forth. And finally, one of them said to the Rebbe, if you look at the article, it doesn't say that you're accepting. It says that we're accepting you. You can't deny that. You can't put a denial about that. That's the fact. And eventually the Rebbe didn't put anything in and they left it. Came the night of Yudshvat, that night, by the way, all this time, I'm going to show you soon how the Rebbe gradually started to do things that a Rebbe does. But the one thing he didn't do was say a mimer. A mimer, Hasidus, is something only a Rebbe really does. And that the Rebbe didn't do. The first time the Rebbe did a mimer was that night, Yudshvat. And that was the sign that he actually accepted. So the Fabrengen started, and the Rebbe was giving his talks as usual. And there was an older Hasidin, a man in his 80s, um, his name was Rabbi Nemtsov, and he said, Rebbe, we're really enjoying the talks that you're giving, but we Hasidim want to hear a mimer. And the Rebbe didn't respond. And then shortly after, you can hear a recording how this is happening, and then shortly after, the Rebbe started with Basi Legani. And of course, the excitement was tremendous. After the Rebbe said, the rest of the Gani, he, in the Maimon, he mentioned something from each Rebbe. So he stopped in the middle, told everyone to say L'chaim, sing a nigan. When they made the first stop, this older chassid who was 80, climbed up on the table, and he shouted, Baruch Hashem, we have a Rebbe. And he made a bracha, Baruch HaTah Hashem, Ulekeinu Melech, Ayum Shechiyonu, V'Kimonu, V'Giyonu, L'zman Hazem. And the Rebbe told him to get off the table, but the Rebbe had accepted. And then the Rebbe spoke about, he said that it doesn't mean that now you can put all your, all, your, all your responsibilities on my shoulders. I'm ready to do the work, but together with you. The Rebbe wants to use this expression, I'll wear you out, you'll wear me out, and together we'll wear out this goddess and bring Mashiach. So we kept our word, wearing out the Rebbe with all our begging and pleading and brachas and situations. The Rebbe is wearing us out with all the miftayim and shlichas and go to Anilu, to Timbuktu and do everything you don't stop. And eventually we'll, we'll bring Mashiach. So there's actually a gradual process. At one point, the Rebbe started to accept people in a private audience and give brachas. That happened at a later point. At a later point, the Rebbe started to accept the pan. It was Simcha's Torah, the first time was Simcha's Torah, and the Gabbai called the Rebbe up to the Torah and called him the way he's supposed to call a Rebbe. And he said, obviously, he must have said L'chaim. 
So when you say l'chayim, you're a little bit less limited. And he took the courage and he said, Yamod Adonainu Mareinu Rabbeinu Ben Rabbi Levi Yitzchak. And the Rebbe walked over. And as if nothing happened, and he just, from that point on, they used that title for the Rebbe. But they did not use it anywhere in print, in publishing, just when he read, called up the Rebbe to the Torah. What? The son of Levi Yitzchak. And um, how do we explain what was going on? Now we need another hour to explain. <laughs> Here we go again. I have to just say this, that this is the tip of the iceberg, but let me just give the general idea. Hasidus talks a lot about leadership and kingship, especially in my marim of Rosh Hashanah, where the davening is all about declaring Hashem as our king. And Hasidus explains that royalty and the power of leadership and kingship comes from the deepest place in a person's soul. And it's something which is so deep that the only way that it could be brought out is through the nation. When the nation expresses to the king their willingness and their desire and their love and that they want him to rule over them, the true king is not a dictator not somebody that rules with brutal force. He has an army, he can do whatever he wants. That's called a dictator. King, in, the way a king is in the true sense of the word, is a person who has unconditional love for his people. The people have unconditional love for him. They're dedicated, they're loyal. He's a tzaddik, he's a leader of a great uh, spiritual qualities, like David HaMelech, Shlom HaMelech, Moshe Rabbeinu, Shmuel HaNavi, all the great leaders of Jewish history. And the power of leadership can only come out when we express our willingness to have him as a leader. I remember speaking about this to our class in level two, uh, Rosh Hashanah time, but I'll, I'll mention it again. This is a little bit of an example, not complete. But the previous Rebbe was once in a hotel. <laughs> And he met in the hotel a singer. He was a world-renowned singer, a Jewish man, not religious, but a Jewish man. And he was going to perform at a concert. And while he was in the hotel, he was rehearsing, was practicing in his room. And then him and the previous Rebbe met in the hallway. So the previous Rebbe said to him, I heard you practicing and I wanna make a, I want to point out that in this particular song that you sang, you needed to go a 16th of a note higher. Mm -hmm. So the man said to the Rebbe, I know, but it's a very, very difficult note to bring that out. But I'm not worried. When I'm going to be on stage and there are 5,000 people sitting there waiting and wanting to hear me sing, it's going to come out. If you understand what this means, it's not about arrogance. It means there's a certain strength, a certain power that it's so deep, I myself can't bring that to the surface. But if there are people out there that are wanting and willing and begging and pleading and, they're, and they give me the strength and the confidence I could do it, that will bring that out in me, that deepest depth of, of, of my um, talent of, of, of singing. So in a certain sense, Malchus, kingdom, is something that comes from a very deep place. And that's why it says there can't be a king without a nation. And the nation has to accept kingdom. And the precedent for this is in the book of kings. In the, in the first king that was chosen, which is Shloy Mahamalach, after King David, it says that when the Navi, the prophet, was told, so what do we do? How do we appoint him as a king? There were three things to do. One is to be anointed with oil. One is to blow trumpets. And the third thing is the whole nation should shout together, Long live the King Shlomo. Yichi Amelech Shlomo. And when everyone sounds that, that will be something which will help him accept kingdom. And we find the same by David Amelech. Yichi Adonia Amelech David Le'olam. So basically, this is what was going on. As throughout the year that Hasidim were, were accepting the Rebbe's leadership, you'll notice that slowly, as I described to you, there's more details, but generally it was a gradual process. The more Hasidim got involved in accepting the Rebbe's leadership, the more that leadership came out. And finally by Yud Shvat, after a year, it came out full. So it wasn't just that the Rebbe was saying, it's not for me. The Rebbe didn't feel that he had it in him. 
because it was something which had to come from us. And until it reached the point where enough of the Hasidim were involved in expressing their willingness for the Rebbe to accept leadership, the Rebbe himself didn't feel that leadership in him was ready to, to come out. And in that case, it took 10 years. It took a year. Apparently by the Rebbe Rashab, it took 20 years. Every Rebbe was different in that sense. But this is one of the uh, principles behind this. So you can imagine that the joy by Hasidim was really tremendous. And finally, we have a Rebbe. The Rebbe accepted leadership. The Rebbe still didn't wear the traditional hat that a Rebbe wears. The Rebbe wore a hat like we all wear. So even after accepting, if you look in the Rebbe's writings over the period of more than 40 years, the Rebbe always says, the Rebbe, my father in law the leader of this generation. The Rebbe always perceives himself as just the hands and feet to which the previous Rebbe is doing everything that he does. But that was uh, the way the Rebbe looked at it. We, from our end, saw the Rebbe as the seventh leader of Chabad. And the Rebbe, of course, knew that this was his position. And uh, that was the beginning of this new era when the Rebbe told us that this is the generation under the Rebbe's leadership, which hasn't changed, it still continues. Uh, we're going to finish the job that was started by all Yidin, and specifically in the last seven generations, to bring Mashiach in, in actuality. L'chaim, l'chaim. Thank you, Rabbi. Very welcome. I guess after the previous rabbi, you know, who was 70, you see a younger person, you don't feel, you know. Some people think a rabbi has to be like bent over backwards, walking with a cane, has to look like he was very out of it. The rabbi was young and strong. And Okay. Mm -hmm. Very important.